sound is all around us, everywhere. It beats at our eardrums until much of the time we're hardly conscious of it. But on this particular Saturday morning, Jimmy Foster suddenly became very conscious of it because a sound made him jump. Or was it really the sound that made him jump? It seemed as though the post was vibrating. Well, he'd soon find out whether there was a vibration along with the sound. The scrap of wood showed him that when the bell sounds, it does vibrate. Jimmy's ears were now wide open to the sounds around him. His eyes were open too. Suddenly he saw the steam from a whistle way over there, but didn't hear it until several seconds later. Jimmy became curious about sound and decided to look up his cousin, Phil Hansen. Phil is a radio ham, runs an amateur transmitter. He should know. If sound is vibration, Phil, how does it get from one place to another? Mostly through the air, Jimmy. You see, the vibration of my voice box makes the air vibrate between us. Then when the air vibrates your eardrum, you hear what I'm saying. Vibration of... Vo vibration of voice box. You can prove that air carries sound by... But maybe you've seen a demonstration of a bell under a glass jar. With normal air inside the jar, you could hear the bell clearly. But when the vacuum pump drew the air out of the jar, there was nothing inside to carry the vibrations of the bell. Nothing until the air was let back into the jar. So you need air for sound to travel through? You need something, but it doesn't have to be air. Here, I'll show you. We'll use a microphone, which is a sort of mechanical ear. Now it picks up sound vibrations and changes them into electrical impulses. These go through the amplifier to the speaker, which changes them back into sound vibrations. Now, the sound of my voice travels to the microphone through air, doesn't it? I guess so, sure. Well, sound actually travels better and faster through solid things. Iron or aluminum or glass. Here, hold the microphone over here. Now, what do you hear? Nothing. And neither does the microphone, or we'd hear it from the speaker. Now, I'll hold my watch up against the aquarium. You hold the microphone against your end. Now I hear it. That's because sound travels better through the glass than it does through air. Now, since the watch is waterproof... I guess that proves that sound also travels better through water. That's right. And speaking of water, it can also show us how sound travels. Toss a rock in a pool and watch how the ripples start from the splash and travel out. And if there's something floating on the surface, you'll see that it's the disturbance that moves and not the water as a whole. Sound travels the same way. Start this bell vibrating. Then slow it down and we see that it pushes out and compresses the air. Then springs back causing a lower pressure, then pushes out again. As this goes on, places of slightly higher air pressure, or compressions, travel outward, separated by places of slightly lowered pressure, or expansions. The distance between one compression and the next is called the wavelength of a sound, as is the distance from one expansion to the next. Of course, the frequency is the number of waves per second. When these vibrations reach your eardrum, you hear the sound. But remember, it's the vibrations that travel, not the air. Say, those vibrations travel pretty fast, don't they, Phil? Compared to some things, yes, but not compared to the speed of light. Light travels at the rate of about 186,000 miles per second. Sound travels through the air at about 1,100 feet per second. That's why I saw the whistle before I heard it. And with your watch, you could measure the distance between you and the whistle. Because light travels so fast, you see the steam from the whistle almost instantly. But the sound traveling at 1,100 feet a second, now if it takes five seconds to reach you, you know that the sound is five times 1,100 feet, or more than a mile away. Say, I can have a lot of fun measuring distance by sound. And there's another trick you can do with a watch. 
know what this is? Sure, it's a light reflector. And it's also a sound reflector. Stand over there a minute, Jimmy. You say it's a sound reflector? Sure, sound can be reflected almost like light. Now, what do you hear? Why, nothing, I guess. All right. Now listen when I hold it so the reflector directs the sound. Say, that's wonderful. It sounds as if it's right next to my ear. Yes, sound reflects pretty much like light. Or a rubber ball. Or like a spring. Try this, Jimmy. Hook one end over the reflector. Now pull it out straight. That's it. Now, the spring is just like air in silence. No disturbances, no compressions. Strike one end of it, Jimmy. Why, the compressions travel right along and bounce off the ends, back and forth. Right. And when sound bounces back that way... It's an echo. In motion picture studios and radio stations, reflected sounds can cause trouble. They often hang draperies to kill some of the reverberation. A combination of hard and soft walls usually gives the best sound quality. Sound quality? Now, what's that? Well, quality. It's one of the three characteristics of sound. We've already mentioned the other two. Know what they are? Well, let's see. Quality is one. Uh, you said something about frequency. Is that one? That's almost it. But let's call it pitch, which depends mainly on frequency. What about how loud it is? Right. Loudness, pitch, and quality. I can show you all three. Show me a sound? Sure. By turning on this oscilloscope, it draws a picture of a sound. Uh, be careful, Jimmy. It belongs to my radio club. Now watch. This is a picture of my voice as I talk, Jimmy. Can I see my voice? Hey, there it is. Now, about these characteristics of sound, we'll start with loudness. Make a sound on the sacrina, Jimmy. Now, louder. The louder I blow, the taller the lines get. That's right. Try it again. The height or amplitudes of the jumps changes according to the loudness or intensity of the sound. And another thing, watch how the sound falls off in intensity as I move away from the microphone. So you see, the loudness of any sound you hear varies with its intensity and its distance from you. And this is shown by the amplitude of the jumps. Shallow waves for a soft note, and high waves for a loud note. Now, what do you suppose shows a pitch? Maybe, maybe the number of waves, huh? Almost right, Jimmy. Here, try running a scale on this and watch. The number of waves does change with the pitch. We call the number of waves each second frequency. And the length of the waves changes, too. Short waves for a high note. Long waves for a low note. Now, you can hear two sounds of the same loudness and pitch, and still they sound different. And that's where quality comes in? Right. Try singing the five vowels on the same note. A, E, I, O, U. Now, compare my note to yours. Me. Me. The waves seem to have different shapes. Yes, the quality of the sound determines the shape of the wave. We can have two sounds of the same loudness and pitch, and still they're very different. And that's that. That's that, but it's not all by any means. There's a whole lot more to know about sound if you really want to go into the subject. But remember those three characteristics. And remember that all sound is vibration. It won't travel through a vacuum, but it does travel through air at the speed of about 1,100 feet a second. It travels even better through solids and through water. 
It travels in waves of compressions and expansions. With those points in mind, Jimmy, you can go on to a thorough study of the nature of sound. That's for me, the nature of sound. 